Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tompkins Square Author Talk with the awesome Sarah Schulman, author of her new book, Let the Record Show, A Political History of Act Up New York, 1987 to 1993. My name is Kaylee, and I'm here with Corinne from Tompkins Square Library. And maybe I think a lot of you are local and you know us on 10th Street between avenues A and B. And we are so excited to have Sarah with us here today. And I'm just going to read her about the author from Let the Record Show. Sarah Schulman is the author of more than 20 works of fiction, nonfiction, and theater, and the producer and screenwriter of several feature films. She is a distinguished professor at the College of Staten Island, a fellow at the New York Institute for the Humanities, and the recipient of multiple fellowships from McDowell, Yaddo, and the New York Foundation for the Arts. In 2018, she was presented with Publishing Triangle's Bill Whitehead Award for Lifetime Achievement. She is the co-founder of Mix NYC's New York Queer Experimental Film Festival and the co-director of the groundbreaking ACT UP Oral History Project. A lifelong New Yorker and East Villager, right? I mean, basically the whole time. She is a longtime activist for queer rights and female empowerment and serves on the advisory board of Jewish Voice for Peace. And we were just actually discussing the format of this talk, and we know that a lot of you are Sarah's neighbors, and we would love for this to be, I know Sarah would, a uh, discussion that's organic, and we're asking questions of Sarah. And please, if you wanna talk, don't even feel like you have to raise your hand, but Corinne and I will be watching for hands raised, and we'll be watching the chat, but feel free to ask questions and I'll give it up to Sarah and you all and ask my own questions. And also you can disagree because I know this crowd. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Anyone? Oh, Kaylee, that you don't, should I just talk a little bit first before we- Sure, yeah, go okay. ahead. Okay, so thank you all for coming and I see some ACT UP here, ACT UPers here as well. So just let me start with my own personal history and how I came to ACT UP and a little bit about the history of AIDS just to um, contextualize the book. So in the olden days, the mainstream media never covered queer people with any um, sense of responsibility. And so we relied on our own media for coverage. There were a kind of, there was a kind of underground press of feminist, lesbian, gay newspapers that were done by volunteer journalists where we sought out the stories uh, and wrote about our own communities. And I was a sort of girl reporter on the go for a number of those papers around 1979, 1980. 1981, I was working for the New York Native, which was the gay mail paper, and I was going to City Hall. And the issue at the time was that there was no gay rights bill in New York City. Uh, Ed Koch was the mayor, he was in the closet. And um, we, in New York City at that time, you could be kicked out of a restaurant, you could be denied hotel accommodation, you could be fired from a job, or you could lose your apartment if you were gay. So getting a gay rights bill was crucial. And in 1981 is when you have the New York Times article, July 3rd, <clears throat> 41 cases of rare cancer found in homosexuals in San Francisco. Now we now know that AIDS probably existed for about a century and was in the United States probably in the 1940s and possibly in New York in the 60s and 70s. But it took science a long time to identify the pattern, that there was something wrong. And that's what this article was expressing. Now, what's interesting is that at that period, homosexuality was a highly contested and stigmatized reality. And there was a prevalent theory that homosexuality was one thing and that it was biological in origin. And people had theories that it was caused by the hypothalamus uh, behind your ear, if anyone remembers those theories. Anyway, so when there was a disease that was in homosexuals or was identified in homosexuals, 
there was a coherence between homosexuality as a disease and the disease of, a of AIDS. And so the first name for this disease was gay-related immune deficiency. And there was a phrase, gay cancer. Now today we know that cancer cannot be gay, but at the time it was a reasonable concept in people's minds because gay people were so despised and so negatively objectified. So um, I started covering AIDS because I was there. I was already at City Hall and I would be like, Mayor Koch, Sarah Shulman, New York native, what are you gonna do about AIDS? And the answer was nothing. Uh, Koch was very hostile to the AIDS community. The city was not accurately counting the numbers of cases. And so this affected funding. And so the mayor was really our media problem and then the president. Whereas in other cities, there was more cooperation uh, with the mayor. So in my first five years of covering AIDS, I covered AIDS through a social justice lens. So I did a story on pediatric AIDS. More and more children were being born HIV positive in New York City, and they were being subjected to drug trials that used a placebo. So one newborn would get the drug and the other newborn would get a placebo. And these were mostly children of color, poor parent, you know, poor families, their mothers had AIDS, often their mothers would die. And I felt that that was unjust, that there was no way that these infants could um, consent to a placebo trial. So I did a big investigative story on that. It was for the Village Voice. My editor at The Voice, Robert Massa, died of AIDS. And then I was sent over to Richard Goldstein, who objected to my point of view. He believed in placebo testing. And so the article got published in, in, in the New York Native. And this was the battle of early coverage of AIDS. Was it gonna be from the point of view of a person with AIDS? Or was it gonna be a point of view of, from science? If you're a person with AIDS, you don't wanna get a placebo. Right, but if you're a scientist, you wanted to get certain kinds of data. Looking back, and I go into this in the book, I realized that the reason I so naturally went to the person with AIDS perspective was because I had come out of the reproductive rights movement. And I had spent the previous years in the abortion rights movement, in the movement against sterilization abuse. Uh, in the 70s, women in Puerto Rico and Puerto Rican women in New York were being sterilized often without full understanding of what the, uh, the procedure was, that it was permanent. And so people in the reproductive rights movement were very sensitive to questions of reproductive rights and consent, especially around people of color. And so from the beginning, that was my orientation. I had a reproductive rights orientation on AIDS. And this would come in later um, in ACT UP. But I also covered the closing of the bathhouses. That was an assignment I had from the New York Native when the New York City Health Department shut down the gay male bathhouses. And that's an interesting assignment because women were not allowed in the bathhouses. So I had never been in a bathhouse. But it was so chaotic that nobody knew what the stories were. Journalists were sick and dying and they were just like, you go to the bathhouses. So I covered that story. By the time ACT UP was founded in March, 1987, I'd already been writing about AIDS for five years. Now, the first five years of AIDS were very chaotic and 40,000 people died in this country. The government did nothing and pharma did absolutely nothing. They owned the patents on a bunch of failed cancer drugs and they were recycling them through people with AIDS and none of these drugs worked. But the reason they were doing that instead of having new research was because they saw this huge market opening up. And if they could find a, a medicine that every person with AIDS could take, they could make a fortune. So that's what they were trying to do was go through what they already owned to see if anything would apply. Uh, in New York, most of the things that the gay community were doing were things like uh, gay men's health crisis had a buddy system. You could volunteer to be a buddy for someone with AIDS. And that would mean like doing their shopping or visiting them. There was an organization called PAWS that would uh, walk your dog. There was God's Love We Deliver, which was founded by Ganja Stone, who just passed away two days ago, that brought free food to home brown people with AIDS. But when you analyze all these services that the gay community was producing, it was basically because of familial homophobia, which was rampant at the time. So a lot of gay people with AIDS did not have any family support. They were completely abandoned. And so the community had to reproduce 
a certain kind of social service network that a person with a family might have been able to access otherwise. Uh, the reason that ACT UP started in 87 is, is pretty interesting. If you go back a few weeks or months, right before ACT UP's founding was the Bowers decision by the Supreme Court. So this was the, the Supreme Court decided that sodomy laws, laws outlying gay sex were correct and should be upheld. And they, they decided this in, you know, five, five, six years into the AIDS crisis. So this was a huge slap in the face to the gay community. And there were demonstrations all over the place in Washington, in New York, uh, very angry demonstrations and demonstrations without police permits. Um, two groups preceded ACT UP in terms of trying to develop some kind of political response. The first was a graphics collective called the Silence Equals Death Collective that designed a poster of an upside down pink triangle along against a black background with the words silence equals death. And they we pasted it all over the city. Um, and then there was a zap group called the Lavender Hill Mob. So a zap action is a tactic that came from gay liberation. And it's a tactic that's only used by people who are shut out of power. Because a zap means like bursting into the room and stopping business as usual. And if you're in that room, if you have a seat at the table, you don't do actions like that, right? So the Lavender Hill mob dressed up in concentration camp uniforms and they burst in on a CBC meeting demanding that they do something about AIDS. So it was in, in the air that the community needed a political response. Then in March, 1987, um, the writer Larry Kramer gave a speech at the center and he famously said, in two years, half of you will be dead. And the people in the audience decided that they wanted to meet and start some kind of organization. So a few days later, they got together and they started ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. And in the next six years, and these are the six years that I cover in my book, even though ACT UP still exists, but in, their, in the six years of their most effective time, ACT UP achieved enormous victories for people with AIDS. And let me just lay out what some of them were. And then I'd like to open it up for some questions or thoughts from you. So ACT UP, these were their, their top achievements. They forced science to change the way it researched medications. So what AIDS is, is it means that your immune system doesn't work. And um, therefore, you can get all kinds of infections. They're called opportunistic infections. So people would get demented. Young people would go blind. They would get develop skin cancers that would take over their bodies and faces. Their legs, their nerves and their legs would swell. They would become unable to process nutrition and would waste away. All of these things are called opportunistic infections. And ACT UP wanted science to focus on treating the opportunistic infections rather than looking for that one pill that was gonna end AIDS because each person was getting a different range of infections. Pharma didn't wanna do that because it was a smaller market share. And ACT UP ran a campaign called Countdown 18 Months that by the way was run by a 17 year old named Garance Frankie Ruda um, that really push science in the direction of opportunistic infections. ACT UP forced the Food and Drug Administration to make drugs available to people who needed them when the drugs had not been fully approved. And the way that that was done was that ACT UP designed the solution. Last night, Rachel Maddow said that Fauci designed this. That is not true. It was designed by Jim Igo inside ACT UP. It's called Parallel Track. And ACT UP designed the solution, presented it. Jim wrote a letter to Fauci and told him the idea. Fauci did not respond. Three months later, Fauci was giving a public talk. Jim went to the talk and spoke to him from the floor. And you know, so, so this is these solutions were created within ACT UP. Eventually, ACT UP did an action at the Food and Drug Administration and shut it down and forced these drugs to become accessible to people with AIDS. In New York City, ACT UP made needle exchange legal, which has had a huge positive legacy of harm reduction in New York City. ACT UP took on the Catholic Church 
The Catholic Church was trying to stop public schools from distributing condoms and act up disrupted mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral in December 1989 and we and maintained condom distribution in the schools. ACT UP also started Housing Works, and there's someone here, Sharon Tramatola, who was part of the housing committee at ACT UP, which uh, you know, was a service for homeless people with AIDS. And also ACT UP really transformed the way that gay people and people with AIDS saw themselves and were seen by the rest of the world. Um, one of the people I interviewed is Donna Binder, who was a photojournalist who uh, shot photos of ACT UP actions. And in our interview, she told about how she would bring these photos to photo editors at all these magazines, and they would say, no, 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 we don't want these pictures. We want those pictures of those emaciated people lying in bed dying. And she would say, no, these are people with AIDS. And only after ACT UP disrupted mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral did the photo editors say, yes, we want those pictures those pictures of people fighting for their lives. And in this way, the image of gay people and people with AIDS was changed forever. So that's sort of the, the bare bones of the thing. Um, and I have a lot more to add, but I would like to just hear Kaylee or anyone in the audience, if you have any questions or thoughts that you'd like to share right now. Yes, the Lavender Hill mob. The Lavender Hill Mob, in, in, it was an old gay liberation group. Um, it was Marty Robinson, Michael Petrellis, I think Bill Bauman. Yeah, Larry Mitchell was a wonderful writer in the East Village, but I don't think these people were in that CDC action. Okay. Anyone else just speak up? Or Kaylee, if you have any questions, please jump in. Sure, Sarah, I know I took the opportunity to bring this up with you shortly when we talked before this, but you know, I'm a young queer who came to New York in 2012 and got enmeshed in lesbian community. And I realized reading your incredible history that there is so much of gay New York that I didn't even know was because of ACT UP, right? Um, I was just actually, looking at harm reduction organizations in the city, I was telling Sarah, and um, the fact that the harm reduction educators were actually a caucus, right, of ACT UP, um, or came from a caucus of ACT UP. And I don't know, just um, more of your thoughts on the legacy of ACT UP that is not so popularized, right? Um, sure, let me just see what Susan wants to say and then I'll go answer you. Uh, certainly. Um, I had two questions. Mm -hmm. um, to me, it's a given that ACT UP was tremendously successful. So given that, I would like you to talk about the structure of ACT UP and how that um, contributed to the success or to difficulties. And the second thing is, as I'm curious, because it's me about the finances and how would they run? Because as today's New York Times article implied, there's a lot of problems with a large group now uh, due to some of those things. Right, Black Lives Matter that took in $90 million last year. Yes, that's yes. that article. So uh, let me start with the money because you're the first person who's ever asked that and I have a whole chapter on it and I was so disappointed that no one else has brought it up. Um, ACT UP refused to file a 501c3 because they were a political movement, not a charity. And so they'd never applied for any funding. So all of the funding came from grassroots. And I could tell you coming from the women's movement, the first time I tabled for ACT UP, people would come over and they'd buy a button and the button was a dollar and they'd give you a 20. You know, because gay men had a, a more discretionary income and they were giving it to the organization. So they were able to raise quite a bit of money completely from the grassroots. The main thing that brought in money were t-shirts. Um, ACT UP had a lot of artists and especially graphics artists and people who had worked in advertising. And the posters and t-shirts were very popular. Some of them are still popular. I still see people walking down the street wearing you know, new versions of ACT UP t-shirts. 
And so I think at the first gay pride, they made $30,000 in cash. Charles Hovland, who I interviewed, had to go home because it was too much money and put it in his apartment and then come back. They were surprised at just how many people wanted it. And then people, as Act Up Chapters started, there were 148 chapters around the world. New York provided a lot of the t-shirts and stickers and buttons and all of that. So that was a source of money. Another big source was that there was a huge art auction um, that almost every prominent contemporary artist that you can think of donated. Uh, and they, and Act Up, the only, per, person who was not represented was Keith Haring, who had been a member of ACT UP. He had just died and his estate was advised by the Warhol estate not to donate anything to auction within the first year of his death because it would affect prices, I believe. Um, there was the, it's in my book. There was a story on page six about it. Anyway, but the art auction made over $650,000. So who ran the money? Well, we had a fundraising committee but who did the finance? Did, you didn't file with the IRS, nothing? Oh, I don't know about that. I, I, think, the ta I think the taxes were paid, but I'm not sure actually. Um, but there was one case, there were two cases where people stole money inside ACT UP. Uh, one person stole $10,000, somebody who was working on needle exchange and he admitted it on the floor, but he never paid it back. And another person stole money and ran away and we never saw him again. But um, what was interesting about the way the money went is women and people of color inside ACT UP never stopped the action to demand consciousness raising about sexism and racism. What they would do instead was run campaigns that would help women and people of color and use the money to run those campaigns. So for example, the Latino caucus, there, was, there were quite a few Latinos in ACT UP. There were four Latino related committees. And the Latino caucus saw that there was really bad problems in Puerto Rico and that Puerto Rican people with AIDS needed some help. So they got money from the art auction to, to send organizers to Puerto Rico to set up Act Up Puerto Rico. Um, also the women ran a campaign for four years to get the government definition of AIDS changed. And whenever women with AIDS needed to go to a demonstration in another city or something like that, that money would be used for that. So people were very smart in the way that they used their resources. Um, I see Mark's hand up. Let me just answer your other question and then I'll get to Mark. Um, the other question was about the structure. So it was a very loose structure. Uh, basically there was a meeting every Monday night at the Gay and Lesbian Center and it would be attended by between three and 700 people. Then there were official committees of ACT UP, the media committee, the actions committee, um, the fundraising committee, and they would each have a member who went to the co coordinating committee. It wasn't called the steering committee because people didn't want to be steered. It was called the coordinating committee. And they would make up the agenda every week. There were facilitators who were elected by the floor and they would creatively run the meeting based on the agenda. And that was how the official business was done. So like if we were gonna do an action at the Food and Drug Administration, that would be decided on the floor, debated on the floor, voted on, and the coordinating committee would get all the committees to coordinate it. But there was also a completely unofficial structure, which was affinity groups. And that was like a group of 15 to 20 people, like-minded people who would meet at somebody's house and they would plan illegal acts of civil, theatrical civil disobedience that they would not bring to the floor. They were not accountable to the floor. And one of the reasons was that ACTIP thought that it was infiltrated by the police. And in fact, in the back of my book, I have the FBI file reprinted. And you can see that ACTIP was totally infiltrated. And also there were a lot of informers. We don't know, I can't tell who they are because so much is redacted. But so these affinity groups would plan these illegal actions the floor did not have to approve them. The only relationship was that ACT UP would provide legal support to the affinity groups. So if we had a big action that was official, the affinity groups would come and do their magic. And, and many affinity groups became care groups later when people were sick and dying. Mark? Yeah, I just thought I'd comment on Susan's remarks. I became very active in ACT UP starting about 30 years ago. This time this spring 
and within a year or so was on several committees. I worked very closely with Karen Timor on the health insurance and healthcare access committee and all the stuff we did around health insurance reform in New York and then was on the coordinating committee and so forth um, and off became a facilitator all that sort of stuff for about 10 or 12 years. But to Susan's point, there was an elected two treasurers who were elected, I think, once a year, if I remember correctly. Uh, the organization was officially a 501c4 organization. Thank you. That's what I wanted to And uh, there were nominal uh, officers, because you had to have three officers in, under New York State law to set up a, a nonprofit corporation. But I don't remember at all who the president and vice president were. We just elected the sec the treasurers, and the idea was they were supposed to keep an eye on each other so that no one would, you know, there'd be no hanky panky. And Sarah's right; there were a couple of incidents where people ran off with money, and you know, it was there wasn't really much we could do about it. You know, um, Mark, do you know what year that five hundred one C four happened? Because I was it was. No, I became aware of it once I got active in the coordinating committee and someone just told me that. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I presumed it preceded my arrival. Yeah, I, and what year was your arrival? Uh, 91. Oh, interesting. Okay, because it was bitterly debated at the beginning. Yeah. Um, I think Marvin Shulman was the treasurer, actually. Yes, he yeah. was one and there was somebody else with him. Uh, and then later on, it was two guys, Joe Chiplock and Scott Sawyer, um, who were longtime treasurers. Right. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Okay, so let me talk a little bit about some of the, am I missing anyone? Okay. I don't think so. Okay, so let me talk about some of the tactics and strategies um, and why ACT UP in retrospect was so successful. So I think the biggest takeaway is that ACT UP was not a consensus-based movement. You did not have to agree. Um, majority ruled at voting, but if you didn't like what the majority was doing, you didn't have to do it. Um, so, and this was never theorized or debated. It just evolved organically that this is the way it was. So if somebody wanted to work, you know, like needle exchange, for example, was controversial at the time. Don, at, the, at that point, David Dinkins was mayor. A lot of people in the black community did not support needle exchange. He was very hesitant on needle exchange. And um, a lot, not everybody in ACT UP supported needle exchange. So, you know, if you didn't want to do needle exchange, you just didn't do it. But you didn't try to stop people who did want to do it from doing it. You would just go off and do your own thing. Um, and because of that structure of being allowed to disagree and to have different people doing their own projects, ACT UP ended up doing an amazing array of things. I mean, uh, you know, when I first started interviewing people in 2001, so I've interviewed 188 people over 18 years. I was like everyone else in ACT UP. I thought that what me and my friends did was what ACT UP did because no one knew what each other was doing. Only when we started interviewing did I learn about things that I had no idea were even happening. So for example, um, the Haitian Underground Railroad. I did not know this about ACT UP. Uh, when Aristide was overthrown by military coup in Haiti, a large number of Haitian people fled to the United States and many of them turned out to be HIV positive. And we now understand that the overpresence of HIV among Haitians had to do with Western sex tourism. But at the time, of course, Haitians were blamed. But now that we see it was uh, European and North American based. Anyway, people were tested and turned out to be positive and the government did not want black immigrants in the first place and certainly did not want black HIV positive immigrants. And they incarcerated them in Guantanamo so that's what Guantanamo was before it was used for Muslim political prisoners. Well, the Center for Disease, I mean, the um, Center for Constitutional Rights and Michael Rat the late Michael Ratner filed suit after suit and finally won that people could be released from Guantanamo, but they had to have housing. And maybe Sharon Tramatola wants to jump in on this. The Housing Committee of ACT UP got involved with trying to get housing for Haitians who were coming out of Guantanamo. And I have an incredible interview with Betty Williams, who's a fascinating person. She was a straight Quaker, she's still with us, 
who had worked with homeless people um, and was in the ACT UP housing committee, desperately searching for housing in New York City for Haitians as they were stepping off the airplane and sometimes lying to the government and not having housing just to get them out of Guantanamo. So that was something that I knew nothing about. The Asian Pacific Islander Caucus. So in the Upper East Side, there used to be a whole gay strip up there. There, were, there was a, a male prostitution right near Bloomingdale's. There was a middlebrow gay male bar called the Townhouse. And there was a whole bunch of Asian gay bars on like First and Second Avenue in the 50s. All of this is gone now. Um, the Asian Pacific Islander Caucus would go to those gay bars and do safe sex information, you know, wrapping condoms in lucky red paper that's used on Chinese New Year and handing it out because the immigrant Asian gay community was not being targeted by anybody for safe sex information. So they were doing something like that, you know, and then you have um, in the book, I contrast three different campaigns, and I'll go into this for a minute because it's kind of interesting, that were done by three different constituencies inside the organization. So for example, Larry Kramer went to Yale with the head of Bristol Myers Pharmaceutical Company. So he could call him up and you know, have a meeting. Or he and Mark Harrington, who was a brilliant leader of ACT UP, who was a Harvard graduate, they could go with, with other people similar to them to meet with Burroughs Welcome. And they would sit down and there would be a catered lunch and they would talk to them, right? But women who were trying to get, so this is interesting why women were excluded from experimental drug trials. In the 60s, there was a drug called thalidomide that was given to pregnant women and many of them had children born without limbs. Pharma had to pay out millions and millions of dollars in settlements. So they were like, okay, no more women in experimental drug trials. So when women with AIDS couldn't call, so the, the definition of what AIDS was to get an AIDS diagnosis did not include symptoms that only women had, like very virulent um, pelvic inflammatory disease, for example. So women were not qualifying, they were dying of AIDS, but they couldn't get an AIDS diagnosis. So they couldn't get benefits and they couldn't get experimental drugs. So ACT UP ran a four year campaign. Now in these days, in the eighties, the government was entirely white and male. The media was entirely white and male and the private sector was white and male. So women in ACT UP, even white women were also marginalized outside of the apparatus of power. And you have this coalition of HIV positive women, mostly women of color, many of whom had come to ACT UP from Bedford Hills prison where they had organized a prison-based AIDS counseling and education program called ACE. And then when HIV positive women would get out of prison, they, would come, they could come to ACT UP or to another group, group called ACE Out. Um, and a, a lot of white lesbians inside ACT UP worked on this campaign. Now they took them two years to even be able to get a meeting because there was no one they could call who anyone had a relationship with. And it took four years to win. By the time they won, a number of the leaders, the HIV positive women had already died. One, because she couldn't qualify for home care and she kept falling at home. I mean, it was you know so different, such a different experience. And then contrast that with a third campaign, there was a constituency of active and former drug, IV drug users in ACT UP who were advocating for needle exchange in New York. And that campaign was really crazy. Like two people OD'd and died. One guy stole $10,000 from ACT UP. They illegally exchanged needles on the Lower East Side, got arrested, had a test case trial and won. And you know, so what these shows when you, when you contrast these three constituencies is that any person can win but you have to pick a strategy based realistically on your social position. And respectability politics only works for some people. For other people, that does not work. You have to yell and scream. You know, and that's just really interesting, contrasting. So you needed an organization that had radical democracy in which there could be so many different approaches and so many different organizing styles going on at the same time. 
Any thoughts or questions, comments? You okay. see from Molly Gray, Sarah. Oh, Molly, yes, hi. I, Molly says, I oh, really appreciate, I yeah, you see. Yeah, Molly says, I really appreciate that your work disrupts troubling revisionist history that frames women as only care, only as caretakers. Thank you, Molly, for saying that. You know, I keep getting, um, I, I, I would talk about this in the book, but I get emails from people saying, can you put me in touch with w women who were caretakers during the AIDS crisis? And I'm like, well, you know, in ACT UP, caretaking wasn't gendered. Uh, yeah, Kaylee makes that point too. You know, all the people I interviewed who took care of people who were dying, it, gender had nothing to do with it. And women were all, were theoreticians of the ACT UP movement. So I answer the person that way, then they write back, thank you. Can you, do you know anyone who you could put me in touch with who was a caretaker? Like the desire to have women be the caretakers is so deep. Um, you know, and I can't imagine that women could be leaders or theoreticians. So thank you so much for that. So let me talk a little bit about the his, his, the making of history and that whole process in this in regarding ACT UP. So ACT UP had a, uh, in 1992, 12 members of ACT UP left. And even though hundreds stayed, it was a very traumatic separation. And ACT UP started to dissipate. And 1992 and three were years of incredible desperation inside AIDS activism. Many, many, many people died. Many beloved people died. There was no progress being made with medications. ACT UP started to do public funerals where people's bodies would literally be carried through the street. At, we even did an action, an ashes action, where people brought the ashes of their lovers who had died of AIDS or their father or their there, someone that they loved, and threw the ashes on the White House lawn. ACT UP was really in a state of desperation, and it dissipated. Then in 1996 is when the protease inhibitors came in, you know, the beginning of the good drugs. And so a lot of people who thought that they were going to die did not die, and people kind of crawled into corners and tried to put their lives back together, and life moved on. But what also happened was the internet revolution, and in the at the end of the 20th century, um, ACT UP disappeared because none of our material was digitized. We were from the pre-internet era. And so at one point, if you searched ACT UP online, you wouldn't find anything. And when people who were thinking about AIDS, not many people were, but they were using the New York Times as their referent. And we had called the New York Times the New York Crimes. You know, their coverage of, of AIDS was terrible. So it was as though ACT UP had, didn't exist. And in 2001, which was called the 20th anniversary of AIDS, but it's really the 20th anniversary of AIDS being identified or seeing that there was a pattern. Um, I heard somebody on the radio saying, uh, at first America had trouble with people with AIDS, but then they came around. And I thought, no, that's not what happened. Because you know, in America, we have this naturalized propaganda that we just always do the right thing and that we just always benevolently come around to what help needs to be done. But um, as anyone who's ever been in a movement knows, people have to be forced to change in this country. Yes, the old redemption story. So um, I just felt like I could not stand by and let that be the story when actually thousands of people fought until the day they died to force this country to change against its will. So Jim Hubbard had already been my collaborator for a number of years. We had started the Queer Film Festival mix, which lasted 33 years, but I think was done in by COVID. But um, so we just decided that we were gonna start interviewing surviving members of ACT UP. We would put the interviews up online and academics or somebody would analyze the material and would do something with it. Then we would just make raw material available. So um, Irvishi Vad, who is a great leader of our movement, at that point was working at the Ford Foundation. This is 2001. And she had a vision that this project could really be something and she gave us money. And we got software, we bought a video camera and we went around and we started interviewing people and putting up their uh, transcripts of their interviews that people could get read for free. Well, to date, 14 million hits have happened on our website, which is actuporalhistory.org. And um, 
you know, the interviews became more and more and more fascinating as the years went by. We learned more and more, and we just thought, God, there's so much here. It's so exciting. This movement was so big. It was so diverse. It was functioning on so many different levels. And um, then suddenly this kind of history started that was all about like a handful of white male individuals who were the heroes of AIDS or Larry Kramer is the leader of ACT UP, which was not true. And the thing that really made ACT UP work, which was how diverse it was and how people were allowed to respond in the way that made sense to them and that there was a simultaneity of response, those things were obstructed. And we were like, this is wrong. Not only is it not true, but it's destructive for contemporary activists because it's gonna give them the wrong information. Um, people need to know that in America, change is made by coalitions, not by individuals. So we felt like it was a state of emergency and we decided that I was gonna write a book based on these interviews. I had conducted all but two of the interviews. And so I sat down and took about three years. I reread all the interviews and tried to cohere the tropes. And the first thing I realized when I was writing the book is that it could not be chronological because it wouldn't be accurate because so many things happen at the same time that I had to find a structure that could capture that. So I came up with this kind of horizontal structure that really gives you a sense of the simultaneity, I hope, uh, and the energy of the movement. And, um, and here we are, 768 pages later. So that's my presentation. Let me see what your, if you have any questions here. What lessons do you think there are for activists today working for social change in various movements? Um, number one is do not try to force homogeneity. Uh, any movement that tries to make everybody have the same analysis or agree on one strategy has failed. I don't think there's any exceptions to that. So radical democracy, I think is the best takeaway from ACT UP. As things start to change over time with needs and the movement, how do different organizations successfully grow out of ACT UP? That's hard for me to measure. There is a book called From ACT UP to WTO that tries to say that, but I feel like, you know, ACT UP was really influenced by Black resistance during the 60s because so many of us were children in the 50s and 60s. And we saw Black people in Life Magazine or Jet Magazine or on television or our families participating in, this, in the civil rights movement, we saw them resisting creatively and nonviolently. And I think we internalize that. And I think this, that ACT UP has played the same role, that people have internalized ideas about ACT UP, but it's very, very hard to get activist information, to actually find out what strategies and tactics were of a previous movement. And that's the purpose of my book, is to convey that information in a way that activists can use today. So thank you, that's my presentation. Unless you have anything else you wanna add? I'd like to ask Sarah, I know um, that at Thompson Square Library, we really love to present on the history of the East Village. Is there anything that you cover that's East Village specific that you'd like to talk about? Sure, uh, let, me, let me go to Terry Bogus first and then I'll come back to that. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, Sarah, something you mentioned earlier in your talk here was interesting to me. You, you mentioned a woman who was a straight woman who led a specific action or an, an, a certain initiative. And, and so it raised the issue for me or the question, given the homophobia of the time and you know what a despised minority we were at the time, how queer was ACT UP? I mean, was it- It was overwhelmingly, it was mostly queer. Or 99%. But there, there were, uh, there were significant women, straight women who were made huge contributions in ACT UP. And I go, and I try to document them in my book. One example is Karen Timor. Karen Timor came to ACT UP. Her only experience with AIDS was that her landlord had died of AIDS and his partner's family stole that building from him because there was no marriage at the time, right? She came to ACT UP and she thought she would meet some great, some nice people there. I think she had seen an article in the New York Times. 
Anyway, at one point, somebody said, oh, we need to do something on insurance. Does anybody here want to take that on? She's like, oh, I could look into it. So she ended up masterminding a five-year campaign in all 50 states without email, mail mail, in which she won um, removing HIV as, a, and I think Mark worked with her. Yes, they won removing HIV as a pre-existing condition for private insurance. So five to 600,000 people became eligible for insurance. Mark, do you want to add anything about that? Yeah, it was started here in New York and the more liberal states picked it up and then it really didn't go national until the affordable care act. It's interesting that it is the most popular provision of the affordable care act and what really was able to stop Trump and the Republicans four years ago from repealing that law was the feature around pre-existing conditions. So it, there was a long legacy. Uh, Karen, uh, along with I and others on that committee, built here in New York a coalition of disease groups, uh, hemophilia, cancer, and so forth. And we all joined together. And that's how we changed the law here in New York. Um, and the Gray Panthers. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. The senior groups were involved, absolutely. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a whole long story there. That. Yeah, um, straight men, there were a few. Mike Spiegel, who had been in The Weatherman, he was a lawyer in ACT UP, uh, but not many. And there was only one parent, Patricia Navarro, who was a Chicana working class woman from California. Her son, Ray Navarro, was a beloved member of ACT UP who died. Um, she was the only parent of a person with AIDS who joined ACT UP, which tells you a lot about wow. the time. Yeah, so um, Haley asked about the East Village. ACT, you know, the ACT UP's aesthetic was East Village aesthetic. The previous generation, the generation that was first hardest hit by AIDS was the clone generation. It was the previous, the previous generation based in the West Village. So those were like the guys with the handlebar mustaches and the kind of longish hair and the tight, um, flannel shirts and whatever. But the East Village had a different look. So it was like very clean cut, white t-shirt, black jeans, Doc Martens, short hair. Um, and uh, the bar, which was a gay bar on 4th Street and 2nd Avenue was a hangout place for ACT UP. Um, you know, things like Wigstock, which used to be at, um, it was a drag festival every Labor Day that was free in Tompkins Square Park was a, a place where we used ACT UP, we used to raise a lot of money actually. So ACT UP was really an East Village phenomena more than any other neighborhood, absolutely. Now what about the schism? Okay, so, you know, there's a lot of reasons why ACT UP broke down and I go into all of them and I try to be as fair as I possibly can. And I think I am fair. To be really honest, I think the main reason was that people kind of went crazy because it was so painful. You know, everybody was very young and an AIDS death is a terrible, terrible death. The person really suffers. And we were just surrounded by death and there were no good drugs and it was very frustrating. Our leadership died. And I think that people took it out on each other. And I think that that was the main reason. If you look at it politically, a lot of it was that at the beginning when there were no treatments, everyone was in the same boat. And then as certain people started to get access to information and treatments and get into government committees and be friendly with pharma and all of that, other kinds of people could not get, get those relationships. And questions about access became more acute. And it broke down around an experimental trial that was called 076 that had to do with women. So this was a trial where pregnant women who were HIV positive were asked to try a drug that would keep their fetus from becoming born HIV positive. At that time, if you were HIV positive, your child was probably HIV positive. And a lot of these women felt really guilty that they were pregnant and HIV positive. A lot of them didn't know they were positive until they were pregnant. It was a lot of poor women and um, the problem with the trial was that the drug that they would take would make the woman unable to take the next stage of drug. She would become immune to that drug. So she was like sacrificing herself for the for unborn child's potential future, which is a very guilt, guilt enhancing situation. And many people felt that that was not a consent situation for those women. 
But it, re it reflected a larger problem, which is that women with AIDS were considered vectors of infection. That was the phrase. They were not considered people with AIDS with their own needs. They were only important because their children would have AIDS. Or if they were sex workers, people were worried that men who uh, employed them would get AIDS from them. Not, and actually it was the reverse because in North America, women very, very rarely transmit HIV to men because of circumcision. So actually women are much more in danger from men than men are from women, but women were always seen as vectors of infection. So it was a battle. It was just like the, the thing I was telling you about earlier about pediatrics and placebo. It was a battle over the patient and who's more important, science or the woman with HIV. And it brought up all kinds of tensions and act up about are some people more important than others and who should have access and who shouldn't and what is access. And the trial was being done in Newark and it was a very poor patient group. And for many of them getting in a trial was the only way they were gonna get healthcare. And the doctors wanted to enroll them because they wanted them to, so all, you know, all of the issues of economic inequality in the United States and racism and our impossible healthcare system converged on this trial and it brought up all the differences in ACT UP at this point, because at this point, some people had a great deal of access. So that was the political issue, but I really think it was much more the emotional. Okay, well, that's, that's what I have to share with you. And if you, the book is called Let the Record Show, and um, there it is. It's 760 pages, but don't be afraid. I think it's a good read. I'm a novelist and I try to tell the story. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Sarah. I learned a lot today. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And again, the recording will be available at a future date. Okay. I'll get it up there fast. Take care. Thank Bye. you, library. Bye -bye. Thank you, library. Thank you, patrons. Thanks, team. Give them hell. <laughs> ah! Thanks, Lisa. Organize. Hmm.